Hi, I'm Dan Merrick with Ruby, and this is our Ask Me Anything Office Hours. I'm the Director of Plant-Based Culinary and Development here at Ruby, and each week we try to come up with a, a good hour segment to be able to answer any questions that our students have culinary related. So basically what you have to do is look on the right-hand side of this box. You'll see a little box on the Ruby platform that says Add Question Here. You can type your question in as long as it's pertaining to food, hit the add button and it'll go to our moderate our moderators um, and then it'll actually show up on the box on the right hand side and if you'd like to see that question answered sooner you can always hit the heart button right next to it and it'll bring it up to the top of the queue so uh, again my name is dan merrick i'm director of plant-based culinary so i typically focus on plant-based uh, answers so usually if something comes up around meat i can't answer them too well so usually we skip those ones for this and we can ask one of our other chef instructors about meat so i'm going to dive right in here with mitch and mitch is asking when planning on using the cooked beans when, when planning on using cooked beans the same day, is it better to drain immediately after cooking or let sit in the water until use, then drain? And when planning on using a day or several later, drain and store or store in the cooking liquid? So that's a great question. Now, typically, um, I'm actually going to drain the beans pretty much immediately uh, after having them cooked. Um, like there are certain recipes that you'll actually want to have some of the, the liquid that you actually cook the beans in to be able to either thicken up a soup or something like that, to get that like nice proteins that are in the water to be able to interact with, um, maybe a sauce or a soup or something like that. And that's great. You can use the water for something like that, uh, or the stock that you've been cooking in. Now, if I'm storing them at all, I'm definitely going to drain them off. Um, you know, if, if it's for longer periods, they'll dry out a little bit, but, um, you know, storing them in the liquid will keep them moist, but they're actually start to kind of break down a little bit faster, you, you know, probably a day earlier, depending on how, um, you know, how short you're going to use them. If you're just going to do them the next day, that's fine to keep them in the liquid. But I personally will typically drain off uh, any of the liquids on beans if I'm storing them in the fridge. And like I said, more than likely, if I'm going to be using them in a recipe, I'm going to drain them off pretty much as soon as I have cooked them, unless I'm using the liquid for part of a recipe. Hope that helps, Mitch. All right, Teresa, is there a way to help with eyes watering when cutting onions? Yes, there is actually. So what's happening with the onions when you're cutting them is it's actually releasing gases off of that onion. Um, and because you're sitting right above the onion as you're chopping, all those gases are coming up and going right into your face and you're reacting with the, the gases that are coming off of those. So there's a couple different ways to do this to, to you know remedy that situation. One is to have a fan in your kitchen where you can actually blow uh, the, you know, the gases away from you so it's not coming right up into your face. Um, I have seen all kinds of other, you know, fun things where people wear goggles and stuff like that. Um, it's a little bit silly, but, uh, you know, a fan or a vent hood might actually be the best option if you're near one of those. Um, there are some other things where people have said if you put the onion in the freezer for like 10 minutes before you're actually ready to chop it up, it'll help trap some of those gases, but they will release eventually. So if they're sitting on your cutting board or in your mise en place bowls and it's thawing out, they'll start to release as well. So my best advice for you is to set up a fan in your kitchen or use the vent hood to be able to help get rid of the crying during onions or just tell people you're watching a sad movie. All right, next one, Mitch. Uh, do you have any suggestions about which probiotics are best for fermentation? I used an encapsulated one and it worked well, but a uh, crushed tablet one, not so well. Do you have a favorite brand? Now, there are a couple different things. I actually have a link here that I'll have Patrick put in for you as well. Um, there are a lot of different brands of pro probiotics. I specifically use vegan ones for cooking when I'm doing something like a fermentation, um, you know, if I'm doing like a yogurt, like a vegan yogurt. Um, they come in droplet forms as well, and those are probably the ones I try to look for most often. Now, if I can't, I'll actually get uh, the tablet, but I'll make sure that it can actually come apart in two different pieces where you'll get all the kind of granules that are on the inside versus one that's just a solid pill because then you have to crush that up and it doesn't quite work the same way. So 
the best option is definitely going for one that you can find in a liquid dropper, which is great. You just squeeze it and you just put out the amount that you need to into it. It works for making those vegan yogurts and vegan cheeses really, really well to get that, you know, the activate activation to start. And usually you can find one with really high levels of proteins in those two and different, you know, strands to be able to make those work. So if you can find a liquid, that's a great one. Now the link that I have on here, I think the very first one is a liquid one, is a liquid one. It's a little bit more expensive though. Um, and there's one, I think it's like the third option is the one that I, uh, I typically will find at like a whole foods or something like that. And, um, it's like Devo or something like that. Like I want to say Devo, like the band, but it's not that, but it's, uh, it's very similar to that. And they have one that'll actually pull apart and you can use as well. And that's what I've used most of the time, but if I can find it, I'll totally go for the liquid option on that just because I know it's going to be able to, uh, interact a lot quicker. Um, and the, the brand that I'm thinking of has a higher uh, amount of the probiotics actually in them as well. Um, so I hope that helps Mitch. Uh, all right, James, do you recommend any additional resources such as related books, articles, online or otherwise to some supplement alongside taking the Forks Over Knives culinary course? Yes, actually I do. So um, the Forks Over Knives is great and they have a lot of materials that actually you can find that are Forks Over Knives branded. So beyond like the movie. They also have great magazines with wonderful recipes in them. Um, their websites are great too, to be able to find recipes on them. They have a meal planner that is actually quite wonderful to be able to interact with. And if you haven't done that, I would definitely check that out through Forks Over Knives. Now, beyond the Forks Over Knives branded material, you'll find a lot of the contributors for the Forks Over Knives um, books and magazines and selections that are a wonderful complement to uh, eating a whole or a whole food plant-based diet and includes no oils. So uh, there are a set of doctors that you'll see even on the Forks Over Knives websites that are, are, are active contributors to those. Um, now, some of those are uh, Joel Furman, who's actually doing a live webinar. Eat to Live is kind of the one that kind of uh, his platform jumped off with great book. So if you find any books by Joel Furman is a great start as well too. Um, there are other platforms, you know, that are kind of in the same vein, uh, you know, so the engine Two diet by Rip Esselstyn, um, you know, the Esselstyn family, all of them really wonderful cooks. The, this is kind of the one that kind of like kicked it off, um, you know, using the research from his father, but just a great story um, and some great recipes in there as well too. Rip also just a wonderful motivational speaker as well. And then um, the Whole Foods Diet um, uh, or the Whole Foods Cookbook, actually. There's the Whole Foods Diet and the Whole Foods Cookbook. Um, I actually have a couple contributed recipes that I did in this as well too. Um, you know, but this is actually, again, a whole food uh plant-based diet with no oil in it as well. Um, it was written by John Mackey and the Sarno brothers. Um, and then had a couple other chefs just contribute some recipes to it, but wonderful recipes in those as well to be able to kind of go through um, and help on your journey and forks over knives. Now there are some other cookbooks too that um, I love. One of them is actually Casa Luce, which is a little harder to find, um, but it's a restaurant in Austin, Texas. It's completely whole food, plant-based. It's not very fancy on the inside. It's, you know, a community based cookbook but it is a uh, hundred percent whole food um no oil as well too so um you know those are probably some of the recommendations that i would kind of steer you towards a lot of different off authors in that same way um also gregor how not to die is another great one that is a great resource for forks over knives um graduates or people just going further into that so um you know it doesn't have just to be the books you know engine 2 has a huge you know following um online as well in fact a uh, good friend of mine, Shard Nolan, who also uh, is an instructor at Ruby, works a lot with the Esselstyn family, um, you know, and helps with a lot of their recipes too. So she's a great resource that you'll see a lot on these live events too, that you can also ask for those too. But those would probably be my recommendations is kind of jump into some of those. Uh, the research is wonderful in those, um, you know, and there's a lot of different recipes, but the online communities for each one of them, just like Forks Over Knives, you'll see is just brilliant because it, there's so many different voices and different ways to be able to do things. I hope that helps, James. All right, Linda. When is it better to use cone-shaped wire mesh strainer and was it better to use a round bowl-shaped wire mesh strainer? So uh, yeah, that's those are basically kind of two different schools. And we're, you know, we I do this too. We call them strainers, but there's it's a chinois and a strainer versus a colander. So there's different types of these. Now the cone wire one that comes down. 
um, like that's traditionally used in, you know, industrial kitchens and stuff. And the reason it's actually in a cone like that is because when you put the liquid in, you can actually take something on the outside and help to kind of push some of the liquid through and keep some of the seeds that are actually in that. Now that's basically straining it out to be able to get whatever liquid you are to be able to get rid of all the big chunks in it. Now the one that has the, oh, the, the round bottom on the bottom of it, well, those are actually originally designed to go in a pot. So you would actually put like your pasta inside of that and then put that on top of your pot of water while it's boiling. And when the water is done boiling, you can basically just take that right off and your pasta is drained and you can still have the water on the stove and everything. So, um, you know, I use them for each style though. Like uh, it kind of, you know, I don't even have a cone shaped one um, in my house, but I have many of the other types of strainers and colanders, um, you know, as well. Um, just depending on how you know fine you want to get something into it so the wire mesh if you're using those uh, it'll work for a, any of those same kind of uh, tools for those as well but typically it's to be able to drain out even fine fine seeds out of things um, and the next step would be to be like go through a cheesecloth or something like that if you needed to get very very just the liquid and no kind of chunks or even tiny micro chunks into it as well too hope that helps um, all right. The next one is, hi, chef. I've tried several times to cook red lentils and they keep coming up very translucent. Is the texture going to be different than brown and green? Thanks. So yeah, they will come out. Uh, the textures will probably come out different on both brown and green lentils and black lentils and red lentils. They all have definitely, um, you know, definitely distinct kind of textures to each one of those. Um, coming up translucent is interesting. Um, and I'm just guessing there might be the amount of water that is uh, put into those as well, too. But um, yeah, so the textures on each one of those, the red lentils um, versus green and brown, are going to come out a little bit different. And part of that's just a little experimentation to see what kind um, or which ones you're using. Because here's the kicker is each brand and each farm, you know, or variety, I guess, is probably the best way to put that. Each variety might have a little bit of a different texture to it as well. So um, just a little bit of experimentation with that. And you'll see the textures will be different, but you'll still get wonderful flavors out of those too. All right. And our next one here is from Janet. What is Burberry Spice Blend? So Burberry Spice Spice Blend, sorry, I'm having a hard time talking, um, is a wonderful uh, spice blend. I've used it in a lot of different things. Um, and I'm trying to remember the exact, I know that there's some cayenne in it. Um, let me just do it quick. There we go. Um, so Ethiopian Spice Blend, typically, yeah, it's red hot peppers, cayenne, paprika, salt, um, that's kind of the basic overview of what's in there. But the great thing about this is it's 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 a wonderful spice blend. I actually do this. There's a, what is his name? I think it's Sid Bryant. I can't remember what his name is right now, but it's a great cookbook. And he actually does these Burberry avocados um, with a collard green on the side. And it's just a fantastic mix. Um, I actually try to find my Burberries at an Ethiopian shop. Um, you'll you'll find different grocers, um, you know, kind of depending on where you are. But when I know I'm in a place that has a high uh, Ethiopian population, I search out to make sure that I can find some of the spices that you can't really find in a conventional grocery store. So um, I know last time I was in, you know, DC, I specifically went to be able to be able to find a really good Burberry and there are a lot of different varieties on it. It's kind of like uh, the word curry, right? Where there's a bunch of different ingredients in it and Burberries can be the same thing, but primarily they're basically dried or ground uh, dried peppers, uh, cayenne, paprika, and then a bunch of other kind of things into it too, like coriander, ginger, cardamom, fenric, nutmeg, uh, allspice and cloves but again that can vary depending on the maker and where you get it from as well too ah oh, patrick thanks for putting the link in there on i'm guessing that's how to make it as well too um nice all right so diane for how long can you keep aquafaba from uh cooking dried beans thanks um Typically, you would say about four to five days after um, cooking it. So it's it's okay to be able to hold it. But uh, last time we were talking about this, um, I believe it was Char that reminded me that you can freeze aquafaba. Actually, I think it was, 
maybe it wasn't Shar, but um, some one of our other instructors reminded me afterward that you can freeze aquafaba, which is wonderful. So if you're looking to keep it for much longer than that, definitely put it in the freezer. I recommend ice cubes for something like that. Like I'll do, you know, pesto and I'll do vegetable stock sometimes in ice cube trays just to be able to have them and I'll keep them in an airtight container in the freezer uh, just so I can grab them and use them as I need them. So if I know that I'm gonna need a little bit of aquafaba, or if I'm cooking beans and I don't know I'm not going to be cooking chickpeas or something like that for a while, I'll put them right in the freezer to be able to have them um, for later. So wonderful way to be able to do that. But if you're using it just out of the pot, I would definitely say four to five days is probably the maximum that I would keep it in the refrigerator. All right. Uh, Natalie, I have a son who loves dairy products, particularly cheese. What would be a good transnational food or plant-based equivalent? Okay, so... Uh, I recently, you know, in the past year and a half moved to Wisconsin and everybody here loves cheese. It's a big, big cheese town. Um, and there, I've had a lot of people come to me and say, look, like I'm looking to be able to transition away from cheese. Um, and I'm looking for something to kind of get me to that next step. And what I usually recommend with people that are kind of taking that step is to take small steps. You don't have to go like, you know, don't swan dive as much if you, if you don't have to. Um, so if you do have to, that's a little bit different, but, um, you know, if you can make that smaller step, try into something that's very similar to cheese and they make so many different kinds of vegan cheeses out there. And there's a broad spectrum of vegan cheeses now that, I mean, it's amazing how many different vegan cheeses are on the market today. And you'll find some, you know, from the shredded cheeses to the blocks and the slices, that you know, Daya started doing years and years ago. Vile Life is actually one of my favorite ones that I've done more recently of shredded cheeses. Um, and uh, that's kind of like the grocery store brand ones that you can get that you can find at a normal grocery store. Um, and if you wanna go kind of that next level up, you can look for something like Rebel Cheese. They're based out of Austin, Texas, but are opening a second location in New York City. But they also just started a mail ordering um, service as well, where they'll make their cheeses out of cashews. They'll actually, actually age them as well in like a cave like they do a normal cheese. Um, and those are wonderful varieties. Those are much, much more expensive than the, you know, vile life or the dyes that you'd find at the grocery store. Um, but you're gonna find that the flavor is so much better than the one you'd find at the grocery store. Cause really by and large, like the, the grocery store brand ones, they're just not quite there. They're great as a replacement, but they're not going to taste exactly um, like what you would, you know, expect out of a cheese. Now, if you're having somebody who's just making that transition over, those are wonderful ways to be able to start to be able to get more towards a plant-based diet. Now, the problem with that though, is that they are very processed. So um, especially the grocery store ones, the ones like the Rebel Cheese and stuff like that, they're, those are not processed as much. Um, but I mean, to a point, but the the grocery store brand ones that you're gonna find at a typical grocery store, um, they're, you're gonna find that they're just very, very processed and they're really not that great for you. Are they better for che than cheese for you? Probably. Um, you know, you're not getting the cholesterol from it. You're not getting all the other things that kind of come with that. And of course, the ethical concerns that come with it as well. So that's a great way to just start the transition that's coming off of that. Now, otherwise from that, you can jump to a whole food, a whole food plant-based diet just by making some other transitional things um, and textures. So avocado is actually a wonderful way to be able to replace cheese if you're doing something like on a sandwich. So instead of putting like, a, you know, or a, a burrito or something, instead of putting cheese as a layer on your sandwich, you can actually put the avocado spread on that as well. We also offer a couple different um, vegan cheeses that you can make at home through our plant-based pro class as well. We have one um, that is using... Um, uh, it's like a gelatin kind of form, which is actually a wonderful way to be able to make it. And it's kind of spreadable as well, which is really nice. And there's also one where you soak macadamia nuts and grind them up and then make it into a roll. And it's kind of like a chev. Wonderful um, options to be able to look at. And that's actually, if you're using a probiotic, that's a great way to be able to make those cheeses because then you get that other kind of, you know, that kind of unique flavor that comes out in cheese and a little bit of umami to be able to match that as well. So I, that's kind of a long answer for you, Natalie, but um, basically, you know, start off with something that's a little more processed, but is definitely closer to the cheese 
you know, area to be able to kind of get off of cheese and then looking uh, a little bit further, going into whole food plant-based, looking at making uh, nut cheeses at home, which is a great option using avocado or other things that kind of mimic the texture and the feel. Um, and you can get the taste, you know, from mixing other ingredients as well. Hope that helps Natalie. All right, Sandra, what is the best method of prolonging fresh herb life? Parsley, cilantro, thyme, chives, etc. So what I always tell people is treat your herbs like flowers. When you get home from the grocery store, you want to basically cut off the bottom. So if it's like your parsley, cut off the bottom stems of your parsley, put it into a glass of water, and then take that produce bag you got them in and put them back over the top and put them in the fridge. I guarantee it's going to last you much, much longer than just putting them right into a, a crisper drawer or something like that, which I honestly do a lot myself too. But um, if you put them in and you treat them like flowers, they're going to last like a week, you know, easily without getting all brown or black on the ends of them. Um, keeping them in the crisper drawer is probably the second best option, you know, for that. But treating them like flowers, putting them in water like that. I've seen different devices and stuff you can have them to be able to keep like that as well, too. Um, but even like putting like a damp paper towel that's had the water squeezed out of it into a produce bag in the fridge might be able to help it a little bit as well. But treating them like flowers, by far the best way to be able to keep those herbs fresh. Um, there you go. All right, Mary, good afternoon, Chef Dan. What is the best way to cook tempeh and how long does it last in the refrigerator? Um, wow, that's a total opinion on how you want to do tempeh. So um, I do a lot of different you know, recipes with tempeh. Uh, sometimes I'll just, um, you know, slice it and do a saute on it. Uh, one of my kids' favorite one is we do a crazy curry bowl, which is a recipe that uh, we came up with Chef Ann Foundation um, for, uh, it's basically for schools. Uh, so it's large batches. And that is basically where you take um, the tempeh in a saute pan, saute it with just regular curry powder, like an Americanized yellow, yellow powder that you would get, you know, um, that says curry on it, um, and saute that. And then the other ingredients are chickpeas, onions, um, what else? Uh, snap peas, and you, um, oh, and coconut milk over the top of that. And then salt and pepper, super easy uh, ingredients that most schools would have. And then you basically um, put the coconut water or coconut milk over that uh, and make sure it's nice and yellow. And then you put that over rice. So, so good. But my kids love that one. But um, for adults, you might want to, you know, do kind of a little bit of a thicker kind of a patty and you can, you know, barbecue it. Uh, you know, you can do it on a grill. Um, you can crumble it and use it in like sauces, like a meat sauce, like a bolognese or something like that. Um, Usually I would boil it before I'd use it in some of those methods just to be, help to get rid of some of the bitterness off the top of that. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of different ways to be able to keep tempeh. Um, and just in the package, when you first get it from the store, uh, it lasts quite a while. I mean, I've had tempeh in my fridge for at least a couple of weeks before using it. And it was fine. Um, you know, after you've cooked it, uh, there's that standard four to five days um, after you've cooked a product to be able to, you know, get it out of the fridge uh, and use it. And you'll be able to tell right away if tempeh is not quite right. It tastes pretty funky when it's gone bad. Um, all right. Hope that helps, Mary. Charles, Chef Merrick, how do you stabilize round vegetables like cucumber and zucchini when you want to dice them small? Well, Charles, I'm glad you asked because Patrick actually has lined up a video just for your question here on how to stabilize things like cucumber and zucchini when you're cutting them. So here's a video on some knife skills on rounded vegetables uh, like zucchini and cucumber. Patrick, I'll let you. Now let's look at long round shapes. Trying to slice a long shape evenly down the middle can be more difficult for some, so you may want to first cut it into smaller pieces. Then slice off a thin piece to create a stable base. Now that it won't roll around, cut it into slices. It's a bit large to use the rolling technique, so use the up and down slicing technique, cutting with the center of the blade. Keep your fingers tucked under and be sure to anchor the knife to your guide knuckle before you start each new slice. When you reach the end, pinch the ingredient to re-stabilize it and then slice in between like this. To dice, stack the slices and cut them into strips. 
Don't try to stack too many at once, and make sure the stack is flat, not unstable like this. Now restack them neatly, pinch the strips together to stabilize, anchor the tip of the knife to the cutting board, then use the rolling technique to dice with your fingers tucked under. For some ingredients, you may want to keep its round shape and not level off the base. In this case, pinch the ingredient and apply a bit of downward pressure to stabilize it. Then carefully insert the knife and cut downward. Notice that if you were to slip here, your fingers are safely out of the way. You can also cut circular slices from any long round shape. Just be careful and go slowly. Use an up and down cutting motion, hold the product firmly so it won't roll, and anchor the knife to your guide knuckle each time you slice. For many soft round ingredients, the slight downward pressure from your guide hand is enough to stabilize the base. Because the tomato is large, use the up and down slicing technique, anchoring the knife against your guide knuckle. When cutting soft round items, you will need to use a bit of back and forth sawing motion to help the blade slice through. To dice, stack the slices, making sure they're not too high like this, otherwise they could slide around when you cut. Now stabilize the slices and cut into strips. Then pinch the strips together and dice. For harder ingredients like potatoes, create a stable base by cutting off one side. As it's a larger shape, the up and down technique will work best. Just remember to anchor the knife against your guide knuckle between each cut. For the last cut, pinch the last piece to stabilize it and slice in between. To cut the ingredient into dice, again, stack, cut into strips, and dice. Notice that for most ingredients, we are using slicing to break them down to the point where we can use the most efficient cutting technique, the rolling technique. All right, Charles, so I hope that helped out. Now that's actually taken from one of our, our classes as well. I think it's in the Forks Over Knives class, but I know it's in Pro Cook as well. But uh, it's a wonderful, um, you know, just example and refresher on stabilizing vegetables uh, when you're cutting them as well. All right, our next question is from James. Uh, do you have any whole food plant-based recipe recommendations for beginner home cooks to implement in practice that will be a challenge but also help expand knowledge and skills efficiently. Wow, there are a lot of those, right? So I think that probably to, you know, you want to start with some foundational skill building, it sounds like. So like I would definitely um, do a soup from scratch. And when I mean from scratch, I mean start with the stock and build that uh, stock up to a couple different versions of different soups. Right. So like just today for lunch is an example. I took a vegetable stock that I had made um, over the weekend. And I do this almost every week where I take all the scraps of vegetables and I put them into a bag in the freezer. And then when that bag fills up, I put it on a stock pot and fill it with water and make a stock out of it drain it all off. But today I took that same stock and I put in some um, dried shiitake mushrooms um, and a little bit of miso, uh, just a little bit of dark, uh, dark soy sauce and some green onions and some tofu and made that into just a nice little lunch, you know, for that. And that's just a very simple build right from your stock, right? Nothing else into that. But I also used that same stock a couple days ago and had my kids help me with the chili. So we chopped up all the ingredients and put it in the pot, used the stock for that as well too. So you'll see going from one to that next step, there's different, different things you'll do in those recipes as far as your knife skills go and as far as your techniques go. So like in the chili, I would cook off the onions first and put in the garlic and kind of build that flavor base up. And I wouldn't add my stock in kind of towards the end. So great way to kind of start building those flavor profiles. Now, other recipes, you know, 
um, to be able to kind of build those foundational principles. Um, think of things that you can build sauces out of as well. So going into sauces and think about different ways to do whole food plant-based sauces to complement things. So, you know, rice and pasta is two really easy things to be able to build pastas upon, right? So being able to do a really good red sauce, um, you know, doing a, a pesto. And I mean, not just like a, a basil pesto, try like a kale pesto, try a couple different versions of pesto to be able to see what you like, what you don't like, what you're building upon and see what's actually happening in some of those recipes as, as well. If you're doing pasta, try the pasta from scratch. Try to actually make a pasta from scratch from, you know, either an Italian style or an udon, you know, uh, great ways to be able to make, um, you know, pasta uh, that you can still do as a whole food plant-based, um, you know, style of those. But I think that those are a couple ways to be able to start off with just getting some learning in, underneath you and really implement and practice on a weekly basis so you'll get better and better. Pasta building is one of those wonderful things that the first time it's going to be a mess when you do it. But after, you know, months and months of doing it, it gets much easier. That's the same thing with breads. If you want to actually do like a whole grain of bread at home, a lot of times the first time comes out a little rough. It's kind of like making pancakes, right? The first pancake usually goes to the dog. It's the saying, right? So um, it's very kind of similar in that same way. So, uh, you know, when you're doing breads, the first one might be a little rough, but the years and years of doing that, you're going to really perfect it and come out with wonderful loaves on those. So think about those in ways. So, you know, doing different soups, doing different um, sauces, breads, and pastas, wonderful ways to be able to, you know, use grains in those ways too. So try those, um, you know, and just keep practicing. The more and more you cook every single meal, the better you're going to improve upon those skills and start adding different recipes in each week. Now, you know, it's okay to be able to stick with what you know, but add different things in there. When you go to a grocery store and you see a vegetable that you've never heard of before, Google it, see what you can make out of it. Um, just to, you know, expand your knowledge a little bit in the kitchen. Hope that helps James. All right, Jennifer, my 24, 18, and 16-year-old children have been uh, resistant to changing their diets. Can you suggest any recipes that have special appeal to teens? Wow, Jennifer, that's um, it's always a tough one with kids, you know? So uh, I think the probably like what I said before is probably the best way to do this is kind of approach them where they are um, and take some of their favorite dishes and convert them into a whole food plant-based style instead, right? So um, it's it's okay that kids have favorite foods. It's wonderful. And they're, it's okay that, you know, some of their favorite foods are not the best for them, but we don't want them to have those every single day, right? So we're not going to eat mac and cheese for every single meal, um, you know, until they're 30, right? But you can take mac and cheese and you can kind of flip it upside down a little bit and make a vegan ver version of it. You can do things like put broccoli into it. You can, um, you know, switch up the ingredients into it to make it into something else. Um, but I think by starting with the flavor profiles that they like is probably the best way to go. So, you know, like I said, if it's mac and cheese, flip it just a little bit into a different style of mac and cheese. Um, try adding other things to the macaroni and cheese to be able to make it so they're kind of taking those you know, baby steps in the right direction. And you'll see the more you kind of play with it, you'll find that they do like certain things, they don't like certain things, but don't stop it the first time they say, I don't like this. Um, you know, our, our taste buds are constantly evolving, especially kids. Um, and, you know, it's, it's it takes seven days to reset your taste buds. So if you go without like salt for an entire seven days, uh, like when you go to, you know, your favorite you know, burger and shake place, uh, whatever, you know, the vegan burger and fry place, you, you wouldn't be able to eat the French fries afterward because the salt would be so overpowering. Um, you know, so kids taste buds are constantly evolving like that. So trying different things often, you know, like at least once a month kind of a thing is, is a good idea to be able to, to, um, you know, get those diets to change a little bit. So my biggest recommendation is definitely go for flavor profiles that they're used to, you know, um, but then switch things up a little bit, you know, make something I know they're going to make, but then add in something that's like, okay, this is your first time trying this. You might not be a big fan of, you know, uh, udon noodles on the first try, you know, but like at least try it and see what you think of it. Um, and that's a rule at my table uh, with my kids all the time is you don't have to like it, but at least try it. And if you don't, if you don't 
Like you have to try it. It's like one of the, the first things we always say. Um, but of course, I'm not going to make them eat a whole meal that they don't like. Um, they're going to have some of their favorites that we've worked up to to be able to make that happen. Um, but again, start with the flavor profiles that they're used to. Uh, mac and cheese is probably not the best for that, but it's a good example for those. But you could also, you know, anything that you can do in, uh, you know, processed world, you can definitely mimic into a whole food plant-based world. You just have to be very inventive about it. Think outside the box a little bit, literally outside the box. Um, and, you know, you can look up all kinds of fun recipes that are great conversions for people. I also find that kids in particular are more likely to eat something if they've made it themselves. So try to get them involved in the kitchen with you. Um, you know, if they're a part of something and they're tasting it as you go as well, they can tell you, you know, like this is just a little too bitter or this is, you know, too sour. Um, or maybe this is too spicy, you know, so kind of switching things up a little bit and letting them be a part of the process, I think will help quite a bit. Hope that helps, Jennifer. All right, Diane. Hi, Chef Dan. Do you have any suggestions for how to keep food warm once it's been plated? I sometimes find myself eating too fast because I want to eat the food while it's hot. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, heat your dishes is probably the best suggestion I would give to you. So um, a, a lot, you'll find this at most restaurants, they actually will have steam trays, you know, that basically it's this big kind of a bin that they keep all their plates in. And it's a steamer that keeps all their, their, um, all, all their plates piping hot. So when they plate them, of course, the salad plates are the opposite. They're chilled. Um, but if they're, the plate is hot and it's steamed ahead of time. It's it's going to keep the food on the plate warmer much much longer. If you're putting a hot entree right onto a cold plate, it instantly starts to cool down very fast. So you can microwave the, you know things. I've seen people put like you know damp cloths in the microwave with uh, plates before to be able to make a little steam effect on that too. I've seen them in ovens, but they can get really hot in an oven, so be careful if you're doing that. But um, you know. Finding a way that you can actually heat your plates at home, great, great way to be able to do that. So I think that's probably your best bet is start by heating up your plates um, and making sure they're not too hot, but they'll actually stay warm and your, your food will be warm until your last bite. All right, Gay, my Sardinian flatbread turned out really hard and chewy. Ideas, I cheated and used a food processor and turned it off just when it balled up. Did I overdo it? You might have. You might have overworked the gluten in that flatbread because that's a very simple recipe. That Sardinian flatbread recipe was taken from a grandmother in Sardinia, you know, like, and she did not have uh, a food processor. I know this exact recipe because I helped design the, the Blue Zones cooking course. Um, and that recipe is very simple. I would highly recommend not using a food processor and just doing it by hand because it sounds like what happened was it, it, you overworked the gluten in the dough and it's becoming really hard. Now that, just to keep in mind, it is supposed to be hard. It comes out very much like a kind of a thick cracker, but it shouldn't have too much chew to it. It should break if you hit it with a fork or a knife or something like that as well but try doing it by hand instead of using the food processor. And I think that you'll have a lot uh, better results. All right, Linda, um, I have a family member, uh, can't have coconut milk, saturated fat. My substitution is almond milk with coconut extract. Thousands of extracts exist. Are there others worth trying? And how do you select quality extracts? Okay, so yeah, there are thousands of extracts. Um, other, tons of other ones that are worth trying. Some of my favorites are almond extract, lemon extract, mint extract, orange extracts. I love orange extracts if I'm doing like a chocolate truffle or something like that. Just a nice little um, switch on the palate there too. Um, to try to find good quality ones is just make sure that the, you know, I, I was, it's always hard when it says natural on a thing, but with extracts, it actually works much better because really in the grocery world, if you say the word natural on the word natural on something, it doesn't really mean anything, but with uh, extracts, it's a little different because they're typically all housed in some sort of alcohol or something like that. Um, you know, and the fewer ingredients, the better, but then you'll have like vanilla bean and that, you know, alcohol that's in there to make the extract. Now where you want to watch out is flavoring. Cause that's a whole different thing. Extracts are derived from natural ingredients. More flavoring is typically, um, much more pronounced, much, uh, you know, bigger flavor, but it's typically, uh, you know, man-made to be able to make a flavoring instead. Um, so always go for the extract, not the flavor. 
without the flavoring. Um, all right. So, uh, Linda, I periodically take temp the, make the template bolognese sauce from the Forks Over Knives magazine. It does not suggest pre-steaming. Would you recommend steaming? Kindly explain your recommendation either way. So I do typically steam um, or boil my tempeh before using it. Um, but the reason I'm doing that is to get rid of kind of the bitterness and this kind of um, odd taste that's with tempeh if you don't do that. But if you're using a strong flavor uh, sauce, you know, like a bolognese, you typically wouldn't have to do that as much unless it's really pronounced. But by and large, I mean, pretty much every time I use tempeh, I use that technique where I'm either going to boil the tempeh or steam it off. And more than likely, I'm going to boil it before using it. Um, and the, it really is just to be able to get rid of that kind of bitter flavor that starts off on it. But again, using a really flavorful sauce will bury that flavor anyways, so you wouldn't have to. And that's probably why Forks Over Knives left it off of that one. Um, all right, Lenora, what is aquafaba? Aquafaba is the protein-rich liquid that beans are cooked in. So most often it's associated with chickpeas, but can be associated to other beans as well. But when you get even like a can of chickpeas, um, the liquid that it's stored in is actually called aquafaba. And it's actually the, what's happened is the protein has basically come out into the liquid, just kind of like a stock where, uh, you know, the vitamins and minerals are coming out of your vegetables and that's what's making the flavor of the stock. But in this case, it's the protein that's actually coming up. Patrick just put a great link here, the magic egg replacer, um, but it is wonderful for um, an egg replacer or using it for all kinds of different things. Thickeners, you can make meringue out of it just by you know whipping it like an egg, like an egg white. Uh, pretty fantastic product that a lot of people just dump down the drain and it's a good thing to be able to keep utilize for all kinds of different ingredients. But if you do a quick search on uh, what can I do with aquafaba, you'll find a just plethora of ingenious ideas on what to do with this magic liquid. <laughs> Linda, I made the balsamic reduction 75% as directed. It became syrupy when I sat it in a bowl of hot water. However, when I used it on a salad, it became toffee-like. Oh, okay. Uh, can I mix more of the same balsamic to fix it? Yeah, you you definitely could. You can use the balsamic, um, but just do it very lightly. In fact, I, would, I might even recommend a touch of water. Um, and depending on how much you've made, just add slow, slowly to it, right? So you can add a little balsamic or a little bit of water. Try a teaspoon of thyme and then whisk it a little bit, you know, to, to get the thickness that you're looking for. And that'll actually be fine. That's It's very common um, if you have a reduction, you know, once it starts to cool off, that it starts to solid up a little bit. Um, so adding a little bit of water, or in this case, if you want to add a little bit more balsamic to it, just whisk it and just do it very slowly to start out um, and whisk as you go. Mitch, what are your favorite fermented foods or drinks and which do you eat or drink most often? Uh, uh, there are a lot for this one. For me, probably my favorite is kimchi. Um, kimchi is, you know, probably one of my go-to fermented foods. I love to make it. My wife hates it when I make it because it kind of stinks up the house quite a bit when I'm making it. Um, but once it's made, man, it's good. So I usually save it for the summer months to make it so I can have it in a place that's a very well vented out. Um, otherwise, there, I will search out, you know, local producers um, that make uh, a vegan um, kimchi because a lot of times kimchi does have fish sauce in it um, or anchovies or all kinds of other things people put in kimchi. But um, finding a vegan one, um, when you find a good one, it's great. Uh, you know, so that's probably one of the ones that I do most often. Um, you know, pickles, I do a lot of uh, pickles around the house too. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll do, you know, your standard cucumbers, but I'll also do, you know, like green tomato, green cherry tomatoes. I'll do uh, banana peppers. Um, you know, I do even jalapenos. Uh, I do a fermented sauces too. So I'll do like a, a sriracha. That's actually I put in the pro uh, the the pro plant course. I believe it's in, in Plants Plus. Um, and that's just Fresno peppers, and you ferment the ferment it for like I think five days. I usually do it for five to seven days, depending on how funky I want it. Um, but those are the ones that I use most often. You know, kimchi is at the top of that list. Probably my hot sauces are some of the ones that I ferment as well, too, that I always have in the fridge. 
Um, but those are probably some of the ones. That, and, and I mean, I've always got mason jars just filled with stuff around the house. Um, so that's a big one for me, Mitch. All right, Mary, uh, I overcooked my lentils and now have lentil paste, but it does have a nice flavor. I'm thinking that I can turn my lentils into patties. Yes, any advice on how I can save them? That's a great idea is, um, you know, what you basically made, Mary, is a binder for a patty. So you can, you, you you can use like a brown rice, um, you know, and uh, kind of work that into it. I mean, if the flavor is good on their own, I might even recommend just starting with the rice and just see how it goes, where you can basically just kind of mix it in with the lentils and then do a saute on each side. You'll probably end up with a really nice tasting, um, you know, patty. But because it's already into a paste, you basically have a binder. So you're looking for something to kind of hold structure to it. So if you just chopped up some greens maybe did a quick uh you know steam on those first um drain out the liquid and then put it in with some brown rice and some of the greens and the lentils and you can form it into a ball and squish it down that sounds wonderful um you know but you're basically looking to add structure now uh since it's turned into a paste and that's a you can you have a lot of forgiveness with that you can go with other grains as well um you know you could go with like a barley or something like that too but um I would start with rice and kind of see how that goes. All right, Sherry, uh, not being a nutritionist, how do I know I'm putting together a balanced meal and getting all the nutrients I need from a vegan diet? That's a very good question. Um, and, you know, nutritionists and registered dietitians are wonderful people to talk to about that. So uh, if you have any specifics on how for you, um, I would definitely search out a registered dietitian or nutritionist to talk to um, about some areas that you might be lacking in in your diet. Um, you know, one of the things that we always taught at, uh, you know, as our like our food coaches, we we're called healthy eating specialists at Whole Foods was if you're eating a wide variety of different colors, you're getting a wide variety of different nutrients, which is, I think is a wonderful way. And when I worked at Whole Kids, we did the same thing. It's a rainbow of colors on your plate equals a wide variety of nutrients and a wide uh, variety of vitamins. Um, you know, so keeping with that model, I think is a great place to be able to start. Now, that being said, there are some areas for vegans um, and vegetarians that might lack out a little bit from not eating animal products. And that's something that I've, you know, had to, uh, I, I take supplements a lot for them and I, I make sure my kids are taking supplements for them too. Now, it depends on you know, your family and, you know, sometimes in history and that too, but things to think about are B12, vitamin D, iron, zinc, iodine are all things you want to think about, um, you know, supplementing and just keeping an eye on. Those are just some of the areas that I personally do from myself and my family. Um, but I primarily will take supplements in those if I'm not getting a lot of them. I mean, I don't have to do iron and stuff like that because I do get a lot of that from my greens, you know, but like B12, D, um, iodine, those are things that I make sure my kids get as well too. Jane, um, I'm currently reviewing the pasta section and specifically the truffled uh, deluxe or, or duxel. Um, I have read that pros say to skip the truffle oil. Uh, what's your opinion on truffle oil? Should I skip it? Wow, I'm surprised that a pro would say to skip the truffle oil because most pros would say add more truffle oil. Um, so here's the thing, uh, you know, if if you're doing whole food plant based, the oil technically is not really in what what we would work with. I would just go right for the truffle, which is fantastic, but unbelievably more expensive. Truffles are very very expensive. Now the way to be able to beat the um, you know the expense of pure truffles is if you take a little piece of that, you put it into an oil in a little bottle, and the truffle flavor releases into the oil. And that's what truffle oil is. Now, there shouldn't be a lot of ingredients in the truffle oil. You should pretty much just have black or white truffle and oil. And that's pretty much it. Now, the thing about truffle oil is it's a finishing oil. Like if you start cooking with it right away, you're going to lose the flavor of it and you're wasting the money. Um, truffle oil is something you finish a dish with. So you put it on at the end and you get this big explosion of truffle. It actually, it's more... Pretty much any truffle you want to add at the very end of it if you're using fresh or powdered or anything like that add it to the end of the dish to be able to get that big flavor truffle oil i think is great for different purposes um i personally like to use truffle powder instead which you can get in like a you know like a shaker bottle just like you would get any spice um you know out of 
on its ground up dried truffle, um, you know, and it's expensive, but you don't use it a ton because it's just overpowering if you do use too much of it. Um, but, you know, as, as far as using that recipe, though, I'd probably use the, the truffle oil on it or use actual truffle for it. I uh, hope that helps, Jim. Shar, well, we were just talking about you a minute ago, Shar. Great to see you here. Dan, what are your thoughts about freezing firm tofu? Uh, how do you use it in dishes once thawed? So um, thanks, Shar, for that question. Uh, I love frozen tofu. And basically what uh, you know what we're talking about here is when you freeze tofu and you've pressed it, it comes out a different kind of a texture than regular tofu does. Um, because it's basically the water cells are kind of you know escaping in tofu and tofu has a lot of water in it. Um, and when you take it out, you can almost peel it and it's kind of like the texture of like chicken or jackfruit or something like that, you know, where you peeling it off and it comes out as a very different texture than the way it would, you know, go in and like what we're used to in cubes and stuff like that. So when you, uh, you know, you can use a fork or you can just peel it back and it comes out in more like shreds, which is very different. And that's great because the texture is very different as well. So you can use it um, like I'll typically, if I have that kind of a form, I'll usually saute it and then use it in something else just to be able to solidify that texture that I'm looking for as well too. And then if you're adding a liquid, it just absorbs the flavor because it's tofu, which is wonderful. So it's wonderful in tacos. You could do it um, in you know any place that you would use like a shredded pork or a chicken in and use that as a replacer recipe for it as well. So uh, like I said, tacos, one of my favorite um, other ways uh, I use, I use mushrooms for this a lot too, or jackfruit is tortilla soup, but this tofu would actually work wonderful in that too. So it's just looking for that texture, I think is the wonderful thing to do it. If you haven't tried, um, you know, freezing tofu, uh, easy to look up the method for it, but you basically just press it, put it in the freezer, bring it back out, let it thaw, and then you can um, peel it like that. It's a wonderful ingredient to be able to use. So thanks for the question, Shar. Great to see you as well. Um, Mitch, I've tried some higher priced heirloom beans from a company in California and red and white beans from a company in LA. The, uh, these were good, but very expensive compared to grocery store beans. Are they worth it? That's a matter of preference, Mitch. So, um, you know, I, I love some of the heirloom beans. Um, and there are a lot of different, uh, beans that have different flavor profiles in them, like thousands of them. So you'll find that there are a lot of different beans that you can find at a typical grocery store that are kind of middle of the road. And that's what they're trying to do, right? They're trying to get like, here's a pinto bean, the way that every pinto bean you've ever tasted is going to taste like. But then if you look to an heirloom pinto bean or beans, because there are many different varieties of pinto beans, um, and you're looking from specific farmers that are looking to grow that one, it's a pretty special experience to be able to have just a little bit more bitterness to it or a little bit more uh, umami to the bean as well. And you'll see that different varieties of beans and different types um, and strains of beans will have different qualities in them. Now, is it worth it? It depends on your flavor profile and what you're looking for. Like if you're doing something that might be um, buried into a recipe, like maybe you're doing, I don't know, maybe you're doing refried beans on a taco that has 15 other ingredients on it. You might not want to go with the heirloom pinto bean, right? But um, if you're doing something that spotlights the bean and you really, the bean is the biggest flavor, like maybe a bean burrito, you might want to go with something like that because it's going to have a different flavor profile or texture to it um, than a regular you know, store-bought bean would. Not to say that there's anything wrong with the regular store-bought bean at all, but, um, you know, having the extra, kind of going the extra mile costs a little bit extra money um, for that as well. Hope that made sense. All right. Um, Gainal, uh, when people are adopting SOS as a part of the diet, how should we approach pink Himalayan salt? Um not 100% sure to go where to go on that. So salt in particular, I don't actually use a lot of salt in my cooking and I usually try to avoid adding salt to it. It's something I just grew up with not using a lot of salt. In fact, a lot of my chef friends 
when they see me cook, they're like, you never put any salt at all into that. And I say, yeah, I didn't. And the way I get around using salt is by using very fresh ingredients um, and herbs. So I don't use a lot of dried stuff unless it's the winter time here, you know, and like in Wisconsin. Um, but primarily I'm going to use fresh herbs to be able to get big flavor. And I'm going to try to get my food as close to the source as possible. Um, so sometimes that might be, you know, like in the winter here going for something that might be grown indoors. Um, but I try to eat in season and I try to eat as close to the source as possible because, you know, as soon as you pick any vegetable from its source, it's starting to decompose at that moment and it's losing its vitamins and its flavor. So the closer to the source, the better. And that helps me to avoid adding salt to add flavor to things. So that is typically where I tell people on the salt contact is where to go. Now there are certain times you might need just a tiny bit of salt and that's okay. But by and large, I just leave the salt shaker on the table and I say, if people want to salt their food, salt your food, but I don't add the salt to it to begin with. Hope that helps. Sandra, does the forks over knives philosophy use traditional sauces like umami, vegan, oyster sauce, teriyaki sauce, red chili sauce, etc. I'm concerned about the sugar content. So, Traditional sauces uh, in the forks over knives movement is a little bit of a loaded question because um, they're not traditional anymore, right? So oyster sauce is made with oysters. It's not a vegan oyster sauce. So uh, vegan oyster sauce, they've done something to it. I mean, I have it in my my count or my cabinet right now in uh, fish sauce, you know. Um, but they're making it to emulate that kind of flavor profile that we would have be in something like a fish sauce, but not adding the fish to it. So there are something that they're doing to process that a little bit more. But the thing is, you're not using a ton of, you know, oyster sauce or fish sauce and then and something, it's just a couple drops of something to be able to add big flavor. Umami is one of the flavor profiles. So it's not typically a sauce, but teriyaki sauce or red chili sauce. Those are two, you know, um, sauces. Now they they definitely usually traditionally have sugar in those two. Now what you can do instead is go the whole food plant-based way and use dates or a dried fruit. Now for both of those recipes, what I would do is I would soak dates in water. So you just basically put the dates um, into a container and then top them off with water. And I would soak them for about eight hours to get them really nice and pliable. So they should squish right between your fingers really, really easily. Um, and you can put those into a blender uh, with the water and it turns into date paste. And I use that as a sugar replacer that's still a whole food, right? Because I basically took the dried uh, fruit with water and blended it up. So there's a processing of just the blending, but it still sticks within the requirements of the Forks Over Nice philosophy being a whole food. So that's actually a great way to replace a brown sugar in one of those sauces and still be able to get the bigger flavors like you're talking about and using the dork the dark soy sauce, using the chilies, all those things to be able to really build upon that flavor and have the sweetness and the sourness at the same time. Hope that helps, Sandra. Uh, Gail, uh, is there a, hand, a homemade white miso recipe? I can't find the sauce at my local grocery store. So yes, you can definitely make white miso at home, but the, it's quite the process and it takes quite a bit. Um, there is a blogger a vlogger and his name is his uh it's pro home cook and patrick if you don't mind putting the link in there he is a great um source for doing things like he, he actually makes misos he'll do some fermented foods as well too but i actually love some of the stuff he does he does a lot of meat as well but there are a lot of fun things that he does like uh white miso that he actually does which is great because he'll actually show you the tamari that comes off the side and everything as well too but it is quite the process to do it um the great thing is white miso is pretty stable. So you should be able to order it online pretty easy to be able to get it to you as well too. Thank you, Patrick, for putting that uh, link in there for Pro Home Cooks. Um, but uh, yeah, you should be able to order it online and get it to your house pretty easy as a white miso, depending on where you are in the world, because it's a little hard sometimes. But if you are having problems, you can always email me and I can help you source some out for that as well. But if you want to make some at home, wonderful. Uh, just have to get some soybeans and a 
big crock and start some fermentation, um, which I'm always a big fan of as well. Um, and if you do that, definitely send us pictures because we'd love to see it um, and maybe even show it on one of our episodes here. So that's our last question. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us at the Ask Me Anything office hours. I hope you had a great day and you learned something today. Happy cooking. <laughs>